turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 133, as we begin, Psalm 133, I'll give you just a few seconds to find that, Psalm 133, and verse 1 there says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Go back a page to Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Today I'm going to pose the question, Why do we go to church? Why do we gather together? Why is that so important to us as believers? A few years ago, there was a very public atheist who asked this question on some talk show I caught him on. And he asked, why do religious believers need to have meetings every week? The American atheists don't have a convention every week. Are, are believers so unsure of their convictions? Are they so uncertain about their beliefs? And I wished I, I could have answered that question and told him, the faith of Jesus Christ is not weak, but I am. Why do people eat every day? Why do most people shower every day? What we do at church is intended to feed our souls and to keep those souls clean. And uh, for just a clarification, the church building is not the church. The church is comprised of those believers who might gather in a building as a meeting place. And as far as that goes, the Lord Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18, verse 20. So there is such a thing as a house church. There was a doofus on YouTube oh, about a year and a half ago, and some of you have seen him. He's got a scruffy beard, and his whole wardrobe consists of flannel shirts. And uh, he stands in front of a bookcase, and he's got all of Dr. Ruckman's commentaries on the shelf behind him, and a few other books. A lot of books that I have in my own library. And so I can tell that whatever he did learn from the Bible, he learned from Dr. Ruckman's commentaries or other preachers uh, cut from the same cloth. Then after Dr. Ruckman died, this guy went on the internet to say that Dr. Ruckman was sinning because he had a church building. That church building structures were not in the New Testament. And uh, now that he's in heaven, he's probably having regrets and second thoughts about having had a church building. Because in order to have a meeting place and call that your church building, you have to comply with certain government and building codes and so forth. And he reasoned that it's not scriptural to have a building. You know something else they didn't have in the New Testament? Electricity. They also didn't have indoor flush toilets in the New Testament. They didn't have cars. They didn't, certainly didn't have YouTube. Is he suggesting we go back and use candles in outhouses? Let's suppose you're blessed enough to have 100 people, 150 people that love you and they, they want you to teach them the Bible. Where are you going to put them? Right. Are they all going to fit in your kitchen? Are they going to fit in your living room? Probably not. You say, well, we'll just set up chairs in the backyard. Well, what if it rains? When there's no hard and fast rules against something in the Word of God, then you adopt um, a non-scriptural, not an unscriptural, but a non-scriptural expedient to bring it about, to, to make it happen, to help it along. And if Christians are blessed to have buildings here in the United States, that's a blessing from God, and therefore you're not sinning by having a building. Not every Christian in the world has a place they can call their church home, or meeting hall, or gathering place, but we're blessed to have that here, and a number of countries allow that. But not all countries do. I'm glad that this one does. But uh, I've met people who don't have a Bible-believing ministry near them. 
They contact us from time to time, asking us to recommend one near where they live. If we can, we do. Um, sometimes it's a husband and wife who are simply being faithful to love God, try to grow in the Lord and grow in the Word of God together. Because millions of people would love to have a, a, a be a part of a Bible-believing church like this one, but there isn't one available to them. We can only empathize with them. But let me offer eight answers to the question, why do we go to church? Point number one, we go to church for strength. And what I mean by that is encouragement. Nobody wants to be the only one who's trying to do right, right? Nobody wants to be the only one who's trying to live for the Lord. No kid wants to be the only one whose parents don't let him go to the movies or let him hang out with certain people or go to certain places. God has so constituted us that we need the encouragement of others who are like-minded in Jesus Christ. They're like-minded in their faith in the Word of God. Or worse, the King James Bible. <laughs> Elijah thought he was the only one in all of the kingdom of Israel who had not forsaken the Lord God. He was uh, troubled. He was frightened, hiding in a cave, discouraged. And God said to him, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. 1 Kings 19, Romans 11, verse 4. He was encouraged after that. How does that old, old expression go? There is what in numbers? Strength. There's strength in numbers. We go to church for strength. Point number two, we go to church for socializing. Let's not deny that fact. The Bible says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Proverbs 18, verse 24. The Bible says, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, verse 17. Your best friends should be from your brethren. And your brethren should become your best friends. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A real friend will tell you something you might not like hearing, but you need to hear it. You might not want to hear it. You might take offense when, he, when they do say it to you, but you need to hear it. You need to stop and consider whether that person's telling me the truth. Someone that's just a yes man, who just encourages you in whatever it is you're doing and offers no contrary opinion, is a sycophant. They're a self-serving, flattering, self-flattering uh, um, fool. They're a parasite. They're hanging on, hoping that some good thing that they say to you will turn into some blessing on their part, blessing for them. But when trouble and adversity do come, you know you have someone to talk to, someone who will pray with you, someone who will still love you, even if the problems you have are of your own making. That's a real friend. Proverbs 27, verse 17 states, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. The Bible says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. And let me say, you can't do that if you're not willing to gather with other Christians. Yeah, you take a chance, you, you take a risk going with to be with other people, but they're taking a risk to be with you. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Believers should enjoy the time they get to spend with each other. 
So not only do we go for strength, but we also go for socializing. Thirdly, we go for the singing. We go for the singing. King David said, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 7, verse 17. We read, And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. 1 Chronicles 13, verse 8. The Bible says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Psalm 9, verse 2. That shouldn't be dull and dreary and boring to a real child of God. Shouldn't at all. The basis of all popular music is always love songs. Some guy's in love with someone wants to sing about her. When the heart is in love with someone, it wants to sing about the object of its affection. And when you're in love with Jesus Christ, you should want to sing about him. Amen. And not shy away from others who do. If the instruments aren't playing that loud, then let me hear your voices sing loud. If the instruments are playing louder, let me hear your voices even louder. Shouldn't hold back. Now, I'll grant you, some people should, can only make a joyful noise. You know who you are. Or the person next to you knows who you are. We all, but we have hymn books in our churches, with each with at least 500 songs, all singing the praises of one man in human history, the Lord Jesus Christ. Other religious groups don't have anything like that. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Revelation 5, verse 9. The fact that the blood of Jesus Christ can save anybody, anywhere, from any culture, from any language, and any society, should give you a reason to sing. Amen. Should be something worth singing about. Amen. Point number four today. As Bible believers, we go to church for the shouting. This goes hand in hand with the singing. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 19. The goodness of God should get you up on your feet once in a while. We read in Luke 17, verse 15. And one of them, the ten lepers, when he saw that he was healed... Turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Luke 19, verse 37. It's the old expression, people go to baseball games and sports events and they shout like wild Indians and then they go to church and sit there like wooden Indians. Why? You won't even remember who played six months from now. How many of you who take notes from sermons, sermon outlines, not necessarily mine, but any of the preachers, the evangelists we've had in here, how many still have notes that you took six, seven years ago from some preachers we had? Who won the World Series three years ago? See my point? Something that's worth keeping, worth hiding in your heart, worth dwelling on and getting a blessing from, and worth shouting about, uh, is worth hanging on to. And the things of this life will all pass away someday. The Bible says of a great multitude, Revelation 7, verse 10, they, quote, cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. You might as well get started shouting now because you're going to spend a lot of time in eternity shouting. Your voice is going to be sore. You're going to go hoarse. 
in eternity shouting the glory and the praises of Jesus Christ. But we go to church for the shouting. Point number five, let me say this. We go to church to study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The King James Bible is the only one that tells the Christian what he's supposed to do, study. And then it tells the Christian why he's supposed to study, to be approved before God and not to be ashamed before him. And it also tells him how he's supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. Some of the new versions say, just do your best. Well, that's very open-ended. That's very subjective. Your best might not be worth anything. The Bible says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So doing your best might be worthless. <laughs> but you and I compare Scripture with Scripture. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Isaiah 28, verse 10. Let the Scriptures interpret themselves. Every pastor uh, appreciates church members who read their own Bibles at home because it prompts them to ask him questions and it keeps him on his toes. Some of you have demonstrated that to me by the questions you've asked. Remember Sister Priscilla that moved? Uh, I still get texts from her asking me Bible questions. So I'm helping someone in Las Vegas uh, answer the Bible question that come to her. And she's a sharp girl and she, she keeps me on my toes. But we call ourselves Bible believers, and as such, uh, if you believe it, you should want to know more of it. There might be a test, right? But we go to church for the studying, to study. Point number six, we go to church for supplication, that is, to pray together. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house. Then hear thou their prayer, and their supplication in heaven thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. 1 Kings 8, verses 33 and 49, respectively. Prayer is talking to God. Supplication is begging God, and not letting go concerning something you desperately need, something you want him to act on. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, verse 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Philippians 4, verse 6. Once you thank God for the things you have, you now have boldness to ask him for things that you want or things that you desperately need. There are some things you can't get from your friends. You can only get them from God. In Luke chapter 18, the Lord talked about the widow who was insistent that some judge uh, help her with her dilemma and her financial problems after her husband was dead. I mean, she wouldn't let him go. She wouldn't let the issue go. She wouldn't drop it. I mean, this guy wasn't returning her phone calls. So she's knocking on his office door and so forth. Right. So he said, just lest by this, by her continual coming, she weary me. So he's going to finally do something about her request. And the Lord Jesus con compared that kind of action with faith. Howbeit when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Luke 18, verse 8. God wants you to be dependent on him. You show that when you are willing to supplicate and beg him for the things that you need. Don't let it go. Well, we go to church for prayer and supplication. Point number seven today. We go to church for service. How can I help the brethren? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
Because Romans 12, verse 1. Because of God's mercies to you, it's not unreasonable of him to ask something of you. In particular, being a model of virtue and purity to the brethren. You're actually serving them when you are. In that way, you... What I mean by that is you don't call unnecessary attention to your own flesh. Whether it's some guy's slick haircut, his cool sunglasses, some girl's low-cut neckline. And in that way, you are helping that brother that sister could, to control their flesh. That goes both ways. Men in front of women, women in front of men. Now you can find loose immoral dressing women all day long, everywhere you go. But it shouldn't be the distraction you get from the brethren in Christ, the sisters in Jesus Christ. But you help meet their needs by doing that. Service also includes giving financially. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 12. You help meet the needs of other believers, brethren, who might uh, not have as much as you have. Some men in churches are great auto mechanics. Some women are excellent cooks. Some people are good at uh, gardening and landscaping. Uh, some people are good at painting, light carpentry work. Some people are good at plumbing and electrical repair. Some women have a great, or fixing someone else's computer. Uh, some women are good at, at uh, women are good at babysitting children, doing any number of things for each other. For every Mary who sits and listens to the preaching, there needs to be a Martha who's willing to change diapers in the nursery, who's willing to help in the kitchen, preferably after washing her hands, right? <laughs> But if you have a talent, you have a gift, you have something that you're, you're good at, you have something you've been working on doing for a living, studying for years, now you can take that talent, that ability, and use it to help serve the brethren, and you're not doing it, then you're failing. You're failing your brethren, and you're probably being disobedient to the Lord. But we go to church for service. How can I be of service to someone else? The Bible says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And uh, especially those who are of the household of faith, Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 10. But we go to church for service. And lastly today, let me say, we go to church for a self-defense class. What I mean by that is learning to witness for Jesus Christ. I took Taekwondo lessons when I was junior high, early high school. We have a couple of black belts in our congregation right now. Um, but I never got into a fight, never had to use any of it. Well, Pastor Schreib's a lover, not a fighter, right? <laughs> Some police officers are marksmen at the pistol range, and they're able to su succeed in their career as a police officer. 30 years they retire and never drew their weapon once. But the Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, verse 17. It's good to be prepared. You and I need to know how to answer skeptics, cults. Catholics, liberals, contemporary Christians, and all the rest. I discovered that in sowing and reaping as a soul winner, there is also such a thing as sowing seeds of doubt. You want to get that person to stop trusting the thing they're currently trusting. And be ready to receive Jesus Christ and trust Him. I'll give you a couple of examples. You have a Jehovah's Witness. Either knock on your door or they approach you on the sidewalk. Well, they don't usually approach you. You have to approach them. 
But you get to talking with one of them and say, listen, Revelation 1, verse 8, says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Or in their Bible, it says, saith Jehovah. Then you run them to, to Revelation 2, verse 8. These things saith the first and the last, obviously the same one, which was dead and is alive. And you ask him, now, when was Jehovah ever dead? So they don't believe Jesus Christ is Jehovah. They don't believe in the absolute deity of Jesus Christ. But you plant a seed of doubt. You give them something to think about. Someone's got a New King James Version. Or, a, or any number of modern translations. So you know, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Your New King James Version says, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Obviously, that can't be right, an imitation to be a counterfeit. I leave it at that. Don't say anything more. You drop the bomb, it's ticking, you walk away before it explodes. Someone's got a New King James Version say, listen, the Bible says, that straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Matthew 7, verse 14. Your New King James Version says, Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way. Well, we know that can't be right, because it's not difficult to get saved. If you admit you're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness, you can be saved. See, you give them something to think about. I remember going to the L.A. County Fair, and there was a guy running a, manning a booth. He had some Bible charts up there, which caught my eye. So I went there, and... Turns out the guy I had met 20 years before, of course, he had gotten gray and so forth. But when I first met him, he and his wife invited us over to their house for dinner. My, my wife and I went. We didn't have children yet. And um, they seemed like nice, decent folks, good meal and so forth. And then afterwards, he wanted to talk to me about some of his Bible views, which I realized later, this guy is a nut. But I wasn't too sharp. I didn't know how to argue and answer with him. But I did tell him, you know, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. And I'm not qualified or equipped to, to change it or correct it or modify it, nor do I think I'm supposed to. Well, 20 years later, I saw him at the L.A. County Fair. And he's manning this booth. And he recognized me from years before. And he said, first words out of his mouth, do you still believe the King James Bible is the word of God? See, what I had said to him stayed with him. And I said, well, or he says, you still King James only. And I said, well, it's still the word of God. Amen. And I said, you know, in the Bible says, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of Christ. Luke 2, verse 33. The NIV and all the modern Bibles say his father and mother marveled. Thus, they call Joseph Jesus' father. That undermines the virgin birth. That undermines the deity of Jesus Christ. Have a good day. And I walked off. And as I was walking off, I looked over my shoulder. He's scrambling to look through his Bible because he had an NIV on the table. I can only imagine what he thought when he discovered I was telling him the truth. You plant seeds of doubt. So stop trusting what they're currently trusting, believing what they currently believe. And the same approach uh, can be uh, used against the Mormons, against cult members, against Buddhists, against uh, Seventh-day Adventists, against evolutionists, against groups of every kind. Now, these are only eight answers to that question. Why do we go to church? There may be more that you can add. But we go to church for strength, for socializing, for singing, for shouting, for study for supplication, for service, and for self-defense. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Behold, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. That's how every Christian ought to see it. Yeah. 